I am ready to go. All right, good. Well, we have uh, opened up our waiting room and we'll let people uh, fill in so they don't miss a minute of this festive lecture. For those of you who are okay. in, the, in the webinar, um, as you know, we're gonna be talking about Wisconsin cocktails. I thought that we could get you to write in the chat. Go ahead and type in the chat. Are you a fan of the brandy old fashioned sweet? Or do you prefer sour? How about, are you a brandy or a whiskey old fashioned fan? I'd be curious to see if, you know what we have in our attendance and yeah, what kind of garnish do you like? So we, we already have one who says sweet with olives. Well, I'll say that I guess I'm the, the boring traditionalist and I have, I am a brandy old fashioned sweet girl and I usually do the oranges and maraschino cherries. So that's, um, in fact, I was thinking about, about having one with me right now, but I decided that I better, I better have my full attention on our speaker so, so I can take notes and, and help moderate the discussion at the, uh, after, after she's done with her presentation. If you do have any questions, if you have some favorites that uh, uh, cocktails that you'd like to ask about or just uh, brag about, um, go ahead and, and post them as well. I prefer if you put the questions in the Q&A just so I can kind of uh, find the questions there rather than the chat. But so if you have a question, put it in Q&A. If you just wanna talk about your favorite cocktails, you can put it in, put it in chat, but I'll find it. All right, well, I think we have many of our attendees already in and people can file in as they, as they come and we'll get started. Right. So welcome to a festive lecture about Wisconsin cocktails. I did decide against making myself one to sip as we listen to our guest speaker. I will be taking notes for later because there could be an old fashioned and a Friday night fish fry in my near future. I'm Joy Cardine. I'm a member of the Plato Madison Special Events Committee. It's my pleasure to schedule and moderate some of our lectures. We thought this one might be fun given that it is tis the season when we might be tipping a cup of holiday cheer or we might be hosting a holiday party or brunch. We will we'll find out the history behind Wisconsin's love affair with brandy old fashions, with Corbell brandy in particular. And I actually have a prop. I won't be I won't be sipping it though <laughs> while we're while we're hearing our guest. Uh, how did Tom and Jerry's uh, become a thing, especially around the holidays in Wisconsin? My dad made Tom and Jerry's every every Christmas time. Not a fan, not a fan, I must say, that's me. Um, why do we chase our Bloody Marys with a beer? Um, how about those boozy blended ice cream drinks? Did you know that they originated in Wisconsin, the ice cream version? We'll be uh, learning much more, I'm sure. If you have questions about your favorite Wisconsin cocktail, type it in the Q&A. I will share them with our speaker after her talk. Our guest speaker is Jeanette Hurt. She is an award-winning author who explores culture through the lens of food, drink, and travel. She is the author of many books, including the one that we are going to concentrate on during this. There we go. Wisconsin yep. cocktails, brandy old fashions, beer chasers, and other favorites unique to America's Dairyland. And I have my copy handy too. Jeanette, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Joy. Well, we're going to start off with, well, so how did we end up drinking our old fashions differently from everyone else in the world? Because if you go any place in the world, except for right here in Wisconsin, you're going to get a dark boozy drink that's made of whiskey. And I actually have a Wisconsin whiskey here from Great Lakes Distillery, about two ounces. Then you're gonna add, they're gonna add bitters, Angostura usually, and then sugar or simple syrup. And for a straight traditional old fashioned, I prefer simple syrup which is just equal parts sugar and water. So it's basically combining in a glass or a shaker or a carafe, whiskey 
bitters and sugar. And basically you just stir it until it's chilled. Once you feel the, feel the outside of your glass as chill, you simply strain it into a cocktail glass. And it's usually garnished with a simple twist of citrus, orange or lemon, lemon. And that's the traditional old fashioned. Now here in Wisconsin, as you know, if you order an old fashioned, your bartender is going to ask you a series of questions. Do you want brandy or do you want whiskey? And most of us will say brandy. And that brandy is going to get added to the bottom of shaker, about two ounces. And then of course, as you know, it's going to, cherries are gonna be added. I have some Soul Boxer brandy old fashioned marinated cherries made right here in Wisconsin, Door County cherries and oranges and sugar. Now, the further north you go in Wisconsin, usually it's a sugar cube, anywhere from one to three sugar cubes, sometimes as many as four if you really like it sweet. And of course, Angostura bitters. And unlike the traditional old fashioned, which is stirred and then strained, this one, the bartender is gonna muddle the heck out of the cherries and the orange and the sugar and the bitters and the brandy. And then after he or she muddles it, it's gonna be either shaken or rolled. And I like rolling because it mixes it gently. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be strained. It's going to be served in an old fashioned glass. And then of course comes the next set of questions from your bartender. Do you want it sweet or sour or press, which stands for Presbyterian, but really means a combination of club soda and sweet soda. And then is the question of garnish. Do you want the traditional orange and cherry? Or as I heard in our chat, some people like it sweet with olives, other people like it with pickled mushrooms or pickled onions. There's no wrong answer to this question. And um, so how do we end up, instead of drinking this, end up drinking this? Well, the most popular told story about this is that in 1893, there was an event held a bit south of us in Chicago. You may have heard of it. It's called the Columbia World's Exposition. And here people saw and tasted things they had never before experienced. They got to ride the first Ferris wheel, explore new technology like zippers, and they got to taste things like cream of wheat, juicy fruit. Even Captain Pabst had his beer entered in a contest in the fair, which he won. And then of course, came up with that clever marketing slogan of tying a blue ribbon around his beer bottles. And if you're with, from Wisconsin and presumably lots of people from Wisconsin attended the fair because something like a quarter of the country's population attended the fair. And Wisconsin had four major railroad lines transporting passengers to, the, to Chicago and to the fair. And presumably many of our residents attended. And if they went to the California Pavilion, there they would have met the three Corbell brothers who were sampling their grape elixir. So the story goes, Wisconsinites went to the fair, tasted Corbell's brandy, and that's why we drink brandy in our old fashioned. Now, this story has been told and retold and is still being told today. And it's been in newspapers, magazines, even some Wisconsin history books. And I knew when I set out to write this book, Wisconsin Cocktails, I had to nail down this story, but I had to have, have it backed up with historical evidence. So I set out to prove the Corbell Columbia connection true. So I began researching it and doing what is the modern day equivalent of combing through newspaper microfiche. And I spent several months looking for any connection between Corbell and Wisconsin and brandy sales. 
and I couldn't find anything. Now, I did find out that Corbell was at the fair and they did display their brandy, but so did 25 other winemakers in California. Not only that, I couldn't, I couldn't find any stories or anything that said there was a big purchase of brandy in Wisconsin. Because the story goes that it wasn't just the people in Wisconsin, it was the good German people who drank brandy, who fell in love with it. Now, what I did find out is a year or two after the fair, there was a major sale of brandy to the German government in Germany. They made their largest purchase ever of American brandy just after the fair. But I couldn't find anything in Wisconsin. Now, what I did find out, however, is in 1894, there was a cocktail revolution here in Wisconsin and a Milwaukee Journal reporter was exploring this story in an article. And he said, you know, for the young German men of Milwaukee, beer was not enough. Beer was too tame for them. For them, there were other mysterious worlds to explore. And that mysterious, those mysterious worlds were about the cocktail. And he went on to describe the most popular cocktails in 1894, just one year after the fair. And there was one brandy cocktail and it was called the Morning Glory, but it was made with absinthe and anisette and soda water. It's nothing like any of the brandy drinks we dr enjoy today. And the most popular cocktail, however, was called the Old Fashioned. And it was made with whiskey, bitters, and sugar. It was this drink right here. So at one time here in Wisconsin, we drank our old fashions just like everyone else in the world. And once I found that out, my question was, okay, so what happened between 1894 and now? And the real reason we drink brandy isn't this romantic story about going to the fair and falling in love with it. What I discovered is that it was a question of access and then marketing. In 1972, again, a Milwaukee Journal reporter explored the same question, why brandy, why Wisconsin? And he wrote an amazing in-depth feature that was published in their Sunday magazine. It was entitled Brandy Mania. He said, he posed the question, why brandy? And some people said it was, well, it's kind of like UFOs. It just sort of happened. But then he interviewed a gentleman who had been involved in the liquor distribution business since 1938. And he told the reporter, well, yeah, we drank a little more brandy than everybody else, but two times nothing is still nothing. He said, we really didn't start drinking brandy in any great quantities until after World War II. Now, after World War II, there was a lot of bad booze going around because some of our liquor distilleries, the ones that made whiskey, were sh shutting down voluntarily for short periods of time so grain could get shipped to Europe. Now, if you read any of the police blotters in the late 1940s, you'll find tavern owners being cited for putting bad booze into good booze bottles. And it was right around this time that Wisconsin liquor distributors caught wind that the good Christian brothers of California had discovered an aging cache of brandy barrels. So they bought them all up. Now, some 30,000 barrels came gushing into our state at one time. To give you an idea of just how much brandy came into our state, that's 6 million bottles, 1.5 million gallons, or enough brandy to fill two and a half Olympic-sized pools. We were literally swimming in good brandy. So here in Wisconsin, if you're gonna order your old fashioned, where are you gonna get it made with bad whiskey, 
or good brandy? Rot gut rum or good brandy? Well, we're smart here in Wisconsin. We knew the correct answer to that question. So we started ordering our old fashions and really almost any other cocktail with brandy. So we started drinking brandy and then our kids started drinking brandy and our grandkids and suddenly it seems like we were always drinking brandy. Now, what I found very curious is along the way, other brandy makers started marketing to us, including Corbell. Now, Corbell stopped making brandy during prohibition and they didn't start up until the 1960s when we were already a brandy drinking state, but they were really smart about their marketing. They had a slogan that went something like only a nickel more per drink and worth it. And you know, that played on our thrifty sensibilities. Huh, only a nickel more, but a lot more in quality. Well, I'll drink Corbell. So we started drinking Corbell and we became their best customers and we remain their best customers. Now, as far as the soda and the cherries and the oranges, that was added during prohibition. In fact, post prohibition in Wisconsin, there were lots of, there were lots of these bartending profession, professors who would come into our state to teach our tavern owners how to make cocktails again after prohibition. Now, obviously people were still drinking illegally in Wisconsin, but to make good cocktails. So they would hold these seminars and people from, from all over the state would come to wherever they were held, which were, was usually of course, Milwaukee or Madison. And then bartenders would learn how to make these drinks. And these professors would say, they hated the adulteration of the old fashioned cocktail. And one part particular professor, he blamed it on the women. He said, we were the reason that the old fashioned cocktail was ruined. But he also said, if you can get women to come into your taverns, then the men will follow. So you need to do what your customers like. So the, my question though, however, is, if it was just the women, then why does everybody drink old fashions? And why did everybody drink old fashions? The old fashioned, the Wisconsin old fashioned is not considered a girly drink. So I disagree with his instructions. Another funny article I read was about bartending slang post prohibition. And here in Wisconsin post prohibition, the old fashioned was called a fruit salad. So that's how we ended up drinking our old fashions differently from everyone else in the world. Now, as you know, we don't just drink our old fashions differently. We drink our Bloody Marys differently. And our Bloody Marys, the Bloody Mary is a newer drink than an old fashioned. The Bloody Mary dates back to the 1940s-ish, and there are a couple different stories about its origin, but it's hard to, it's most likely was invented by a Parisian bartender who brought it with him to New York. And what was interesting, I thought, is in Wisconsin, we started serving Bloody Marys in the 40s, right after they made their de debut. And one of my favorite stories about Bloody Marys was published in the 1970s about how a Madison mother's group every year at back to school would make pictures of Bloody Marys after their kids went off to school. So we were, we've been drinking them for a while, but you know, in Wisconsin, if you get a Bloody Mary, they're different from everybody else. And they're different in two ways. The first way, of course, is a typical Bloody Mary is covered with an entire meal on top of it. It's not just a measly pickle or a celery spear. It's an entire meal, usually with cheese, beef, uh, in usually either beef jerky or beef sticks, sometimes a shrimp, a lemon, a lime, olives, sometimes cheeseburgers, sometimes fried mac and cheese, 
casserole pieces. I mean, I've even seen entire rotisserie chickens on top of our Bloody Marys. Now that phenomenon dates back to the 2000s. I mean, we always on special occasions would stick a shrimp on, especially on weekends and add a few more things, but it wasn't until the owner of Sobelman's in Milwaukee decided to stick a cheeseburger on top. And then he posted on social media and asked people, what do you think? And people went crazy. And then of course, all of a sudden it seemed like bars everywhere had their own signature extravagant item on top of their old fashioned, or not old fashioned, Bloody Mary. But the other key, so that's more of a recent phenomenon, but the beer chaser, which I think is incredible because you go anyplace else and you have to pay for a beer chaser. Here in Wisconsin, it's absolutely expected. And the reason for this is in part because we have so many breweries and oftentimes in the past, people would order, you know, a shot and a beer. And in other places, it would be a shot and a glass of water, but not, of course, in Wisconsin. But the other key thing I learned is in the early 1900s, there was a drink here in Wisconsin called the Red Robin, which was basically beer and tomato juice. So we had been drinking beer and our tomato juice for at least a century, possibly longer. And so it was natural that when we started making Bloody Marys, they were served with beer chasers because, well, you, as you drink your Bloody Mary down, you're supposed to pour the chaser into the Bloody Mary. Some people don't, some people prefer to sip it. I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to drink a Bloody Mary here. Now, the other two drinks we are going to talk about are, of course, the ice cream drinks. And it's, I, I mean, one of the things I also think is pretty amazing, it may be cold out, it may be snowing, but people will still go and order ice cream drinks because, well, ice cream drinks are delicious. And, but if you go to other places in the country, there is a phenomenon called boozy milkshakes. Now, boozy milkshakes are not ice cream drinks as far as I'm concerned, because they just, they're not. They're kind of the same thing, but they're more of a hipster, modern type bar on the coast kind of phenomenon, although you'll find them here in Wisconsin too. But the thing is, is if you order a Brandy Alexander, a Banshee, a Pink Squirrel, a Grasshopper, here in Wisconsin, they're not going to be made with cream or half and half which is how they'll be made any place else. Here in Wisconsin, they're gonna be made with ice cream. Now, what's interesting is some ice cream drinks were originated here in Wisconsin, but the two most popular, the Brandy Alexander and the Grasshopper came from other parts of the country. The Brandy Alexander came likely from New York and it originally was a gin Alexander which doesn't sound so good to me. Gin and cream and creme de cacao just doesn't float my boat. So I think that drink eventually evolved into the Brandy Alexander because brandy tastes better than gin with cream and creme de cacao. The grasshopper was invented in New Orleans and it was invented for a bartending competition. Now, the thing is, when the cream drinks became popular, and they became popular, especially post-prohibition in the 40s and 50s, here in Wisconsin, initially, cream drinks and ice cream drinks were kind of side by side. And if you talk to any old-timey owners of supper clubs or the current owners who know the previous owners who asked that question, they will find records of both, like in Bryant's and the Del Bar. Both of them have records for both cream drinks and ice cream drinks. Now, one reason why ice cream drinks became popular is bars here in Wisconsin actually had blenders as part of their equipment. If you go to most bars other places, they're not going to necessarily have blenders. 
And that's obviously a key way of making ice cream drinks, unless you want to take a muddler and muddle the heck out of ice cream. And it doesn't quite work at that, what, that well. And one of the reasons we had blenders is because blenders were manufactured here. And in fact, the, some of the initial blenders, the really old ones, they were made for bars. So instead of shaking them, they could just blend their drinks with ice to chill them. That of course, isn't what they were eventually used for. They were used for ice cream drinks. And of course we have supper clubs. So the ice cream drink phenomenon has been preserved and it's not just, but it's not just supper clubs, other fine restaurants, bars, cocktail lounges, they will make ice cream drinks as well because of course we're also the dairy state and that's another reason why we enjoy ice cream. Hold on a second while I turn this um, ringer off. And so that's one reason we have that and ice cream drinks by themselves are, they're really a Wisconsin phenomenon. Now there are some ice cream drinks, the Banshee, the Pink Squirrel and the Blue Tail Fly may have been invented here in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee by the late Bryant Sharp, who is the original owner of Bryant's Cocktail Lounge. Now here's where I have trouble saying for certain that he invented it. He always said he did, and he said he sold them to liquor companies, but Bowles, which is actually the first company with their creme de noyau, their, that pink almond liqueur, back in the late 40s, I wanna say late 40s, early 50s, they were promoting their creme de noyau with an actress who was touring the New York light nightclub circuit with an actual pink squirrel, a real squirrel who was dyed pink and the squirrel ate nuts and she ordered pink squirrel cocktails at all of these bars and nightclubs. And that's how the pink squirrel became a thing. Now, so we can trace the story of the pink squirrel to, to a certain date and era. But when I contacted the folks at Bowles, they said they didn't have any records. Now that doesn't mean that Bryant Sharp didn't invent them. It's possible that he did, but it's also possible as I've learned, bartenders like to talk and tell stories and sometimes exaggerate things just a little bit. But one thing's for certain, I don't think any pink squirrels, banshees or blue tail flies are served regularly in other parts of the country. Also, I would add Golden Cadillacs, another one. You, you go down to Illinois, you go west to Iowa, you go east to Michigan, you're not gonna find them on menus, but you're gonna find them in lo on lots of menus here in Wisconsin. And we'll finish our discussion with the Tom and Jerry because the Tom and Jerry is a cocktail also, not invented in Wisconsin, but it made its home here. The Tom and Jerry as a cocktail was invented likely in the 1830s or 40s or a little bit before. That's where we have the earliest records of the Tom and Jerry as a cocktail being mentioned in newspapers and magazines of the, the era. Now, Jerry Thomas, who is credited with writing the very first cocktail book, The Bon Vivant's Guide, or the bartender's manual. He came up with this lovely book and he was the first bartender to write a book of all of his recipes. And he told people that he invented the cocktail and named it for, to, for two pet mice he had named Tom and Jerry. And he had this whole elaborate story of naming the cocktail. And if you read his obituaries, it's mentioned that he's the inventor of the Tom and Jerry. Now, he's not the inventor of the Tom and Jerry because there were much earlier, much, much earlier evidence that it existed. 
and he first bartended in New England, which is where the Tom and Jerry likely originated. It came to Wisconsin, and by the 1880s, it was a big thing here, as it was a big thing everywhere in the country. Now, by 1902, however, there, the New York Sun was heralding the end of the Tom and Jerry. He said, the writer wrote that the Tom and Jerry has become extinct, just like the dodo bird. But of course, that might have been in New York, but here in Wisconsin in 1902, the Tom and Jerry was flourishing and it continued to flourish. We drank them before prohibition. We drank them during prohibition and we continued to drink them after prohibition all the way up to today. My favorite story about Wisconsin and the Tom and Jerry and how iconic it is is that during prohibition, the feds made a raid on a saloon here in Milwaukee called Doc's Saloon on Clybourne Street. And the feds came in the front door and the customers and the bartenders ran out the back door. And on the back bar, there was a steaming bowl of Tom and Jerry that the feds found. And if you read any newspapers from the 1880s forward, they would start talking about Tom and Jerry season. And one thing that I think is interesting is because all these other places stopped making it. But here in Wisconsin, again, like our old fashioned, once we start drinking something that we like, it doesn't leave. We don't stop drinking something just to chase the latest trend. If it tastes good and it's well-made, we'll drink it which is one reason I think here in Wisconsin, we never had what a lot of bartenders and bartending historians call the dark days of cocktails, AKA the 1970s and 80s, where sours on a gun and um, disco type drinks were popular. Here in Wisconsin, people still made things like the old fashioned from scratch. Now, even if you use a, um, an old fashioned mix here in Wisconsin, you're still going to get a really good cocktail. And most bartenders know how to make a good old fashioned, even dive bars. You can go to sports bars. They'll know what you're asking for and they'll be able to serve you a really good classic cocktail. And one thing I feel is both of these are classic cocktails. They're just different. The Wisconsin classic cocktail technically is more like a highball because you're topping it with soda, and but it's served in an old fashioned glass. Whereas the traditional old fashioned, it's just an, it's the way it was originally made, but of course we changed it in response to prohibition. And then the fact that we couldn't get good whiskey in the late 1940s. And one thing I found really interesting is the Milwaukee Journal used to survey its readership and they would have this very detailed survey about, you know, what tires did you use, what toothpaste, any and everything which the marketing and advertising department would then go and market ads to places so they could say, we're the number one whatever, or we're selling the number one toothpaste in Milwaukee. In mid 1940s, they asked what was the number one spirit that men, because of course women didn't drink it, drink at home, but what did men buy to drink at home? And the number one spirit was whiskey. But by the 50s and 60s, they were asking their readers, what type of brandy is your favorite? So just in a very short period of time, maybe 10 to 15 years, we went from a whiskey drinking state to a brandy drinking state. Now we still drink a lot of whiskey. That's something, um, if you go to any bar, you will find whiskey is served and there they are, that's also the question, do you want brandy or do you want whiskey in your old fashioned? So we do drink whiskey. In fact, Northern Wisconsin is often a testing ground for national liquor companies 
and distilleries that want to test out certain whiskeys because if they like it up there, they'd probably like it everywhere else, which I found really interesting. And I learned from a bartender who worked from for a liquor distribution business here in Wisconsin. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, there are some questions um, in chat. I was just counting um, our very unofficial survey in the beginning and everybody said sweet, except um, one, one whiskey sour was, was mentioned. Oh, I take that back. There was a Southern comfort old fashioned that was mentioned. And in fact, somebody asked a question about the Southern comfort old fashioned um, saying that they did that in college when um, they were in college in the sixties. You want to, I mean, is that a, the Southern comfort old fashioned? Southern comfort is a whiskey based, but it's also got a bit of orange liqueur in it. It's a whiskey, but it's not exactly a whiskey. SoCo came into our, was invented and marketed and became popular in our state in the 60s and 70s. Um, my parents, I will say, they used to drink Southern Comfort Manhattans. That was their drink when I was growing up. Um, and it was also my grandparents' drink. So it was definitely a thing, in especially in the late 60s and then through the 70s. And it still has its place today. If you like Southern comfort, I would suggest trying Wolf, Wolf Peach. It's a whiskey that's got a peach and pecan um, infusion. It's a sweeter whiskey. It's really good. And if you like Southern comfort, you'd probably really like that, that brand. And I think it's distributed here. I'm not positive, but it's made in Kentucky by some, um, it's, and it's backed by some country singer. I think Jason Aldine might be part of it. Um, it's, a, it's a really lovely, lovely whiskey. Um, I was gonna ask I, Jeanette, is the whiskey, it, it seems to me my, um, the younger people in my circle, my nieces and nephews and, and other younger people that I happen to know, seem to be m more whiskey fans than brandy fans. That's just anecdotal. But is are we seeing any sort of shift based on... Is some of it because whiskey has become really explosively hot. Anywhere you go, whiskey is pretty big. But also, they got used to it because their friends were drinking it. And they probably are used to basic, you know, the basic level of Corbell. Now, if they were to try a less sweet brandy, they would probably like it because it's more like a whiskey. It's not sweet. Um, and if you're looking for not sweet brandies, I d here in Wisconsin, um, Wollersheim makes one, but this one, like bright, Bright Woods by Great Lakes Distillery, apple brandy made with Wisconsin apples is not sweet. They also make a whole line of fruit brandies. And right now I'm experimenting with their pear brandy. It makes a really sort of elegant cocktail. I also really like Copper and Kings and Berto, which is spelled B-E-R-T-O-U-X. It sounds French, but it's California. <laughs> It's French by way of California. It's a modern aged, not sweet brandy. And another good one is, like I said, Copper and Kings. It's California brandy that's aged in Kentucky. And it's a brandy that's treated more like a whiskey. And I think your, your nieces and nephews should try it. They probably like it. I will pass that uh, along. Um, we have a question uh, about... You had mentioned that we're still um, the b best customers of Corbell brandy, but is a Wisconsin still um, Wisconsin has does Wisconsin still have the highest per capita usage of brandy in the United yeah. States overall? I don't think we drink quite as much as we did in the '60s and '70s, but we drink more than anybody else now. Other and it's interesting because you talk to national bartenders and mixologists and spirits makers and different people are predicting that suddenly brandy is going to get popular again. 
It hasn't yet. Now, people who really like spirits, a well-made brandy is a beautiful thing. Um, but it's still, it's not as popular as whiskey. And I don't know exactly why that is. Maybe whiskey just has better marketing. That could be a thing. Um, but brandy here in Wisconsin, we still drink more than everybody else. And if you go to any supper club anywhere, you'll see the ice cream drinks come after dinner, but before dinner, people are drinking brandy old fashions, some whiskey, but mostly brandy. Yeah. Um, we definitely drink more than everybody else. And we have one request to please repeat the name of the, of the Southern comfort light drink that you mentioned. Let me, um, if you can hold on just a second, I can grab the bottle and you can see it. That would probably right. be the easiest. Hold and on. Well, she, okay. Sure. And as uh, Jeanette's going for the bottle, um, I will pass along that uh, someone had an old fashioned once that was made with maple syrup. Fabulous, but haven't seen this done in bars. I had one of those too. Um, it was called a, a fall harvest. Um, I, I don't know why maple syrup isn't a fall product, but um, we'll ask Jeanette about that too. Oh, so Old Camp. It's called Old Camp Peach Pecan Whiskey. They also make this wolf whiskey. That's where I was getting confused. It's really, really good. If you like Southern comfort, you'd probably really like that. So now, um, I'll, I'll ask you about Mary Jo's observation. She said she had an old fashioned that was made with maple syrup one time. She thought it was fabulous, but she doesn't see bars doing this. Do you see bars I'm doing things like that? Some bars do, you go to any cocktail lounge and they will make you their special version of our brandy old fashioned. Um, if you go to a Spanish restaurant, they might make it using imported Spanish brandy. Um, I've seen maple syrup, I've seen honey. I think if you're curious and you like to ex experiment, I would say be, you can take maple syrup I think you can also, cinnamon infused simple syrups go really, really well in a brandy old fashioned. If you're to do a Christmas one and you probably have almost enough time, maybe not quite, um, usually you need exactly a month. And if you want a Christmas drink, what you do is you take a cup of cranberries and a cup of brandy or whiskey, and you just throw it in a glass jar and you let it sit. And within a month, it will turn a bright red color and it will smell like cranberries. Oh. And it's, it's delicious. You can use either brandy or whiskey. I learned this actually from a Kentucky bartender and she did it every year for her, um, her old fashions, which were traditional old fashions, but it was her Christmas ones made with cranberry whiskey, which you can do. And we, we definitely make, we produce more cranberries than any other state. So that is another local connection. You can also make a cranberry simple syrup which is basically just boiling some cranberries with water and sugar, straining the cranberries out, and then you've got the cranberry flavor. And that is something it's, and that's the other thing. A lot, if you're gonna, for example, a maple syrup, simple syrup, basically equal parts maple syrup and hot water, that's it. And for a Wisconsin cocked old fashioned, start with a quarter of an ounce of either maple syrup or simple syrup or honey syrup or whatever syrup you're using, go up. I mean, you can go as much as one ounce, but that would be very, very sweet. And I heard you mention that some people like sour old fashions. The best sour old fashioned I've ever had was made with top note tonics, grapefruit soda. 
and it's made here in Wisconsin. And it's made by Mary Pelletieri, who she used to work for Miller and Goose Island, and she was eventually going to open up a brewery. She wanted to do herbal beers, but then she got into tonics and the science and the flavors of tonics. And she makes a fantastic grapefruit soda that's made with real pink grapefruit juice. It's not too sweet. It makes incredible, incredible old fashioned sours. Sounds so good. I do recommend. I was going to ask you a little bit. I did have, um, we, I had an old fashioned just last night, actually at a little holiday happy hour. And it was from a mix, which was, it was good. It wasn't bad at all. And you mentioned that you can even, in, you know, you can get decent mixes in Wisconsin for the old fashioned. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just about every one, bar seems to have them now, too, for takeout cocktails. Those that do that. Do. Mm -hmm. They do. There's one company, I think it's called the Myers Brothers. They're mentioned in my book. Um, if you want a ready-made old fashioned with the booze in it, I recommend Soul Boxer, which is an, both of them are Wisconsin companies. That was it. And Soul Boxer, they also make their Door County cocktail cherries, which what I love about that is they infuse these cocktail cherries with their brandy old fashioned. And they make them once a year. And when they're sold out, they're sold out. Sequist Orchards up in Door County also, I think, makes cocktail cherries. And it's Michigan-based, but Traverse, Traverse City Distillery, they're a whiskey distillery, and they make whiskey-infused whiskey cherries that are also really delicious. Now, what I will say, my favorite thing to do, however... Because if you are in Madison or Milwaukee or Door County, usually there are farmers who come once a year from Door County and they bring their bounty to the farmer's market. And my local farmer's market, when they have cherries, I end up buying a whole bunch. And I like mine pitted because I don't like to spit out pits in my drink. But basically, you just take a cup of cherries, maybe a little bit of sugar or dissolve the sugar in some water and then brandy. And you put them in a jar and you put it in your refrigerator and you have homemade cocktail cherries made with real Door County cherries. And they're so good. It doesn't, there's a recipe in my book, but basically it's just shook, a little bit of sh sugar, brandy and cherries, throw it in a jar, put it in your refrigerator. They will preserve them. You can, Boil them a little bit if you want, but you don't have to. We have a question. Um, very, it's a good one. How do you make a Tom and Jerry? Okay. Tom and Jerry, the cheater's way or the quick way is to go to the store and buy batter. Here in Wisconsin, you can buy frozen Tom and Jerry batter. That's another thing. You go to other states. I've never seen it anyplace else. Um, and not only that, certain grocery stores specialize in Tom and Jerry batter. I mean, there's a question on my local neighborhood Facebook group, and they're like, where can I get some Tom and Jerry batter? And somebody's like, oh, Festival Foods does a really good job. And I interviewed this one guy who was actually at a cocktail making class I attended. And he was just like, yeah, when I was in college, I worked at a grocery store and I got sick of it because we would make gallons upon gallons of the batter. Now you don't have to get sick about it. To make a Tom and Jerry cocktail, basically you need a good base recipe is about six eggs separated, one cup of powdered sugar. And I would say, I liked, this is, a riff on the recipe I got from the dairy farmers of Wisconsin, throw in some mascarpone cheese. Now what you do is you whip up the egg whites separately. If they're pasteurized, you're gonna wanna add maybe a quarter teaspoon to a half teaspoon of cream of tartar. Whip them up until stiff peaks. Beat with about a tablespoon of the powdered sugar. 
the rest of the powdered sugar beat into the um, the yolks and also whip in the mascarpone cheese. Fold that into the egg white mixture, add vanilla or vanilla bean paste, vanilla extract, and then the basic spices are cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, allspice, but you can add basically mix and match sort of like the pumpkin pie spices, except for maybe mace. If you use the, and don't add turmeric because that will make it very um, yellow. But I would say nutmeg and cinnamon. And then if you want to add a little ginger, whatever your favorite blend of spices are, you could also add some cardamom. It's what you like. And then to make a Tom and Jerry, you take about a quarter cup of batter or a couple tablespoons, put it in a mug. You're going to want to heat up some milk or some water. I prefer milk, but some people do it with water. And then also add about an ounce of brandy and an ounce of rum. Some people also add the brandy or the rum into the batter. And that's it. And the batter, what I would say is stored in your freezer or refrigerator for a week or your freezer a little bit longer. And then you basically put it in. It's like a hot, warm eggnog is what it is and it's decadent and it's delicious and as one bartender i interviewed said here in wisconsin we can take something that's bad for you and make it more unhealthy <laughs> <laughs> always you know i mentioned in the very beginning that i wasn't a big fan and i think that comes from my when my dad made these tom and jerry's around the holiday time I was young and I took my very first sip of one when I was, you know, still, a, 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 you know, I was underage and I just, it, it was not my favorite taste in the world. And I didn't understand why anybody wanted that. I'm also not a big fan of eggs. So I think that's probably why I, you know, I don't. Uh, I would say you probably would like the mascarpone version a little bit better because it's, it's sort of like tiramisu in a glass. That I would like, that I would like. <laughs> and I, the story that he used to tell when he was in World War II, he used to be a bartender in Northern Wisconsin before he um, he, he joined uh, the military um, during World War II. And he, there was some, some high ranking general or somebody that wanted to have a holiday party and he wanted to find someone that knew how to make a good Tom and Jerry. And so he found, we, because my dad was a bartender from Wisconsin, he, you know, picked him up. I don't even know, you know, how far he, tr he sent him to um, come and make, make the Tom and Jerry's for a, uh, for for the uh, you know for the soldiers who were who were celebrating at that time, so I thought that was a, a, a funny story. That, That's a great story. Yeah, um, we 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 have a few more minutes with um, with our our speaker, and we do have a a request to repeat the name of the book. It's Wisconsin Cocktails, Brandy Old Fashions, Beer Chasers, and Other Favorites Unique to America's Dairyland. Jeanette Hurt is uh, is the author. So uh, one thing I did want to ask you a little bit uh, more about was the the bitters that go into the the old fashioned okay. and other cocktails because I know that bitters um, in Door County you can go in and become a part of the bitter by taking a shot of bitters at Nelson Hall okay. I believe it is. Yes, Nelson's Saloon. Um, Nelson's. What's interesting. We drink more Angostura bitters than any place else in the world. Um, not just because of our old fashions, but mainly because at Nelson, they have they, their bitters club where you can get shots of bitters. Now that started during prohibition because he said, well, these, he's like, this is medicinal. So he would serve up shots of bitters and people, the feds tried to arrest him. He never got charged. And that's how he stayed open during prohibition. I'm guessing he probably served other things, but the bitters club has continued. Now that bar has had seven owners since the original owner and the current owners, she said, you know, they bought it. And she was just kind of, when she got there, of course it's Washington Island. So it's this little tiny Island and she was considered an outsider until she wasn't but it took a while, but she said, you know, she's tried other bitters 
but she doesn't prefer anything except for Angostura. And she says that people who have stomach problems cannot tolerate the shot of bitters. They usually think it tastes awful. But the people who have pretty good digestion systems, they think it tastes pretty good. Um, I did try it. I have not drank it sis, since, but I do like the taste of Angostura. It's more like baking spice. Outside of using it in cocktails, my two favorite things are, you know, if you want a little something that's really not that alcoholic, a couple shots of Angostura over seltzer water, and you have a little bit of a cocktail taste, but not really but it also tastes good over ice cream. But more importantly, if you mix about a tablespoon of Angostura bitters and a tablespoon or two of brown sugar and use it to coat, and a tablespoon or two of butter, and you put it all on the top of a grapefruit and you broil it, it's, it's like the best brunch grapefruit you'll ever have. Stick a cherry in the middle. It's, amazing. It is so delicious and, and good. I, yeah, that's probably one of my favorite things. I'm going to do it. I did. I, I didn't mind the taste at all when I did the, the shot of, of, of bitters at, at, in, on Washington Island. Before we end, and we're, we just have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask you about the brandy slush that so many people make. Yeah. For for the holidays, which I I you know I I did not I did not take part in that tradition, and I and in fact I'm not even sure I've ever had brandy slush. So tell tell us a little bit about that and how it became a holiday slush thing. Is typically a summer drink. It's our it's Wisconsin's version of sangria. It's a party punch, but it's a frozen party punch, and it's basically some people use tea, other people don't. It's basically lemon, ready-made in a can, lemonade, limeade, or, or orange juice, or some combination of that, plus tea, plus sugar, plus brandy. I also recommend, again, adding some bitters. And then you freeze it, but you kind of stir it up, and it becomes a slushy mix. And then you top it with soda. And it's a holiday cocktail, and it's delicious. And, you know, you could add like a cherry limeade. And I would say you could make it festive, add a little bit of cranberry jelly or some cranberry syrup and you can make it festive. But I think people, if you're entertaining in Wisconsin and you wanna serve a cocktail, it's a good cocktail to serve for a group. And, you know, we're inside or outside. And, you know, like I said, we drink ice cream drinks in winter. Why wouldn't we drink a slush during winter? We're hearty here. We, we can handle that. We're not, we're not wimps. We're Wisconsinites, <laughs> you know? Right. And I'm going to, I'll give it a try. Hey, I'm, I'm nothing wrong with that. It's been a pleasure, Jeanette. Thank, thank you so much for being with us. And um, so much, I'm going to echo Susan, who said uh, so much great information. And it really was. It's uh, there's a, there's a lot to Wisconsin cocktails and thanks for sharing well, it. Thank you so much. The, the highest compliment you could pay an author is to promote my books on social media and to write online reviews if you like my book because that helps boost my book in sales and it lets people know that, hey, this is a good book. And one of my purposes in writing this book is to show people outside of Wisconsin that we really have a quality cocktail culture and a rich history here because people talk about New York or New Orleans or Kentucky and it's like, well, we have I'd say a cocktail culture that rivals or exceeds all of those places because we never had a time when we didn't have good cocktails. And what's interesting to me is to see what is going to be the next big cocktail here. I'm not sure. I think one thing that's continued here in Wisconsin that ended in other places are sweet martinis. They're a big thing. You go to different 
bars and supper clubs and any vacation spot and they'll sell them and we have they haven't left and i i would think you know it's probably going to continue well, happy holidays to you, Jeanette, and cheers to you. And cheers. thanks to thank you very much to all of our attendees for your attention and your your good questions and um, for playing along on our, our little quiz on brandy, old-fashioned, sweet, sour, or whiskey. At this point in our um, programs, we usually uh, promote our, our next lecture. We do not have a January lecture set up quite yet. You can always check our website and newsletter for updates, not only for lectures, but for other special events and uh, things coming your way in 2022. Thanks again for joining us. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Thanks.